Welcome everyone to today's faculty professional development lecture. Today we are featuring Heidi Eichbauer and Jen Fitzpatrick, and this talk will provide an in-depth look at how faculty approach developing a new class at CCS. We'll lead things off with our presenter's bios. So first, our first speaker will be Heidi. Um, she is a liberal arts adjunct faculty member who has taught a variety of courses at both CCS and Wayne State University. She earned her Master's of Arts in English Literature from Wayne State and also pursued a PhD with an em emphasis on history and theory of rhetoric. This background allows her to identify the interplay between the production and interpretation of discourse, knowledge, and material culture, and brings an interdisciplinary approach to her students. Her current work explores the figuration of women in various historical texts as historical notes offering insight into current debates surrounding gender and sexual difference. Our second speaker today, Jen Fitzpatrick, is an assistant professor of the foundation program and has taught a variety of courses at CCS, including color and light, 2D and 3D design concepts, digital fundamentals, 3D design techniques at CCS, and color and material design at the MFA level. She earned her MFA from Wayne State and her BFA from the University of Michigan. Her sculptural practice is rooted in concepts that speak to the shape and color language of awareness, sensory and visual language, and the response to environmental concerns. So now as our speakers begin their presentations, we ask our audience members to please hold their questions until the Q&A portion. And our first speaker today again is Heidi Eichbauer. Okay, so uh, can you see my screen? Okay, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming. So uh, let me start at the beginning. So I developed this um, talk around two, um, two intersecting uh, areas of pedagogy that I think a lot about when um, developing a class. So um, they are promoting academic literacies. And in particular, I wanna focus just on reading. Uh, so it also encompasses writing and critical thinking um, as well, and then also uh, facilitating transfer of knowledge. Okay. So a little bit of background. Um, I gotta minimize it. Oops, a little bit of background on the state of academic reading. Uh, so not just at CCS, but um, more widely. So an estimated 75% of com community college students and more than 50% of four-year college students are unprepared to meet the literacy demands of college. Uh, the clearest differ differentiator in reading between students who are college ready and students who are not is the ability to comprehend complex texts. And the way that this translates at CCS is that at least, uh, at least in the liberal arts is that students represent a wide range of skill levels to start out. Uh, in addition, in the average classroom, if the instructor says do the reading, only 20 to 30% of students do the reading. And um, just in talking to instructors in the liberal arts, I think that is probably the most common pay issue that's raised uh, among us is, is uh, that students, most students or many students don't do the reading. So um, there are many reasons uh, why students might not do the reading. Okay, but uh, one important one to consider is that reading is difficult and it might evoke all sorts of um, bad feelings. And there are studies that um, deal with this. So students have a complex relationship with reading for academic study and many experience significant negative effects and self-perceptions in relation to their um, academic reading tax tasks. Okay, so, um, A lot of times students will, uh, students will come up to me after class and, and reveal this, that they have difficulty in reading um, or uh, in writing essays. And so always the thing that I acknowledge is that it's not just a statement about their skill level, but also there are layers of um, aff uh, affect yes, okay, that are at play in that. Okay, so uh, given that, um, uh, the question is, how do I help my students develop academic reading skills? And academic reading skills 
um, essentially are just independent reading, close, careful reading, reading across text and stamina for dealing with uh, more complex and longer works. And uh, I should also mention that text can be interpreted broadly to include uh, film and other visual media. So, so careful reading of film and media. Okay, so why is this important? Okay, so enhanced, uh, enhanced engagement with academic reading extends learning across multiple dimensions. So that includes individual reflexivity, uh, disciplinary participation in the case of CCS, that is art and design practice and research, a okay, social equity and global awareness. And I want to um, touch a little bit on this uh, idea of social equity in terms of reading pedagog pedagogies because um, ex explicit, okay, part of my, my uh, talk is to, to emphasize the need to make reading pedagogies explicit um, because it helps empower all students, but in particular, um, disadvantaged students or students uh, who come from under, underfunded school districts, ESL students, and students with learning disabilities. And the effect of that should ideally be that the range and skill, and skill level among students should have effectively started to narrow um, by the time a CCS student reaches their junior okay, or senior year. Okay, so how do I do this? Okay, so um, these are my uh, go-to tactics to promote um, course engage or link engagement in course text. Um, and that is I make all of the reading material if possible, uh, currently that's all of it, uh, is available on Canvas. Uh, I choose texts that represent a range of complexity, both for the required reading that I provide and the supplemental reading. Um, so it's important to introduce students to complex, te complex texts because uh, there's really no other way to help them build and escape their facility um, with academic reading without doing so. Um, but I should also mention that it's really important to be explicit about that. So if I introduce a, a, a difficult text, um, I, make that, I make that known to students that this will be difficult and um, do the best you can with it use the reading guide, and then when we come together in class, we'll break it down together. Okay, so I also um, use a variety of text formats, including videos, podcasts, and film. Uh, also, particularly if I'm developing a new course, I uh, develop a course reserves at the library and look at what the library holdings are, and um, oftentimes I will order books in. And then finally, and most crucially, if I assign a reading, there is a reading guide. And um, the reading guides uh, can encompass um, a variety of methods to help students engage with the text um, that would include just questions that would help them elicit the main points. Um, sometimes I'll have students develop questions about the reading of their own or make connections from the reading to something in their awareness in pop culture or um, art and design. And then also, um, so the reading guides are great, okay, but okay, it's also crucial that I uh, encompass okay, the reading guides in some way into my assessment. And so there are a variety of ways that I do that depending on the class, okay, but um, that could have them developing reading responses, not for each of the reading, but I usually uh, divide students into groups so that I know in any given class period that at least a handful, three or four students have done the reading um, prior to coming to class, um, and they, they'll help facilitate the discussion. So and this can also occur um, in discussions on, on Canvas. Okay. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, tactics is that there is this app um, in Canvas called Perusal, and I just started playing around with it, so I don't, uh, I just want to touch on some of the key features. It's really super easy to set up in your uh, course. Uh, essentially go into the settings, um, tab over to applications and then search for Perusal and then you'll have to have a CCS key code, um, but it's freely available for both instructors and students so it doesn't cost anything. Uh, and then you can just move, uh, it, this will show up in your navigation panel, you just move it up so the students can see it. And then I had a couple students, a few students uh, from one of my classes this winter, we didn't actually use it, but um, I wanted to see 
their process from the student end and how they access it. And uh, literally, they just have to click on it and the uh, they just click on it. And then uh, their, their profile picture from Canvas will migrate over um, and uh, be listed here in the students, uh, under students. And so um, it basically is an e-reader that allows students to collaboratively um, annotate a text and it uses social media features. And so uh, you can see that I've uploaded in the library to text here. Um, uh, students just need to click on it. It can create the assignment, give the page range, uh, and then students just highlight areas of the text and make comments. Um, they can hashtag one another. Uh, they can use emojis. Uh, and then uh, if they hashtag someone, uh, say someone writes a question on the text and then um, someone answers it and hashtags that person, that uh, response will be sent, sent to them um, rather than them having to be in the app to see, see that response. So it's uh, got some useful features, uh, including uh, once the annotation is done, um, it'll collate all of the comments that the questions uh, that the students made uh, it'll include analytics, um, including a confusion report. Uh, and so I think um, just from looking at this, uh, playing around with it this semester, that this is probably something I'm going to integrate into my reading pedagogy um, moving forward. Okay, so uh, academic reading is foundational to this next concept I want to discuss, which is uh, transfer of knowledge. So transfer is a cognitive practice whereby a learner's mastery of knowledge or skills in one context enables them to apply that knowledge or skill in a different context. Because transfer signals that a learner's comprehension allows them to recognize how their knowledge can be relevant and to apply it effectively outside original learning conditions, transfer is often considered a hallmark of true learning. And there's some resources about transfer at the Yale Center for Teaching and Learning that's linked up here. Uh, so there are a variety of ways um, to help facilitate transfer. And so I think Bloom's taxonomy uh, is a useful heuristic for doing that. And so one way to promote transfer is to create assignments that promote deeper learning. And so basically the levels sort of uh, overlapping uh, recursive levels are remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and, uh, create, and creating. So in all of my classes, I have an assignment that focuses on analysis. And uh, the way I structure it is to enlist students' artistic process and talents in order to recursively and dialogically move across the various cognitive skills. So reading is down here, okay? And then um, I want them to move across all of these okay, stages. And so let me talk a little bit about my assignment. Uh, so there's some iteration of this almost in all of my uh, classes. So it's a visual creative analysis and uh, it has, I broke down these components. You can link to the my full guidelines um, on Google Docs here. Uh, so it includes um, students' um, artwork or design work, um, research secondary sources. And uh, the thing that I evaluate primarily is the written abstract. So um, let me put that out there that I'm not um, evaluating the artwork. There is maybe um, six, points and a rubric of, uh, of 30 that um, deals with the artwork, which is just to, to say that they've, that they've engaged uh, in the process. So what I'm more, most, more so looking at is their process of analysis. And so they can uh, use as an entry point sort of research topic based on the course theme or um, prompts or reading guide questions. Okay, as the basis for the entry point, and then they can develop their artwork and then uh, recursively work back down into their process of analysis okay, in their written work. So again, the analysis is then of the artwork okay, itself. And then I have them explain their art and design elements, their responsibility to the topic, uh, is it manifest in their work? So um, the importance of research and secondary sources, and then finally, I have them reflect on uh, process and medium. So uh, here's some examples. Okay, so uh, here's an example um, that I think demonstrates really well levels of transfer, but also that skill of reading across text. So um, this is from a reading um, 
of James Baldwin Notes of a Native Son. And this particular student, he transferred in his uh, fascination and interest in superheroes. So um, American antiheroes had, uh, that Baldwin succeeded in the way many American antiheroes had in um, comics and film. And so you could see the illustration is uh, like a comic. And then this student also, yes, Okay, references Plato's Allegory of the Cave uh, to describe Baldwin's father. father and um, that's not text that we read in this class. So that was transferred in from, from another course, presumably, or maybe the student read it on their own. Um, and then finally, there's a level of transfer from okay, the text, yes, um, from the 1950s and current um, time. So this this last panel here. So towards the bottom of the page, a faceless illustration of a Harlem police officer beating a young black Harlemite. The faces remain black to convey the violent cyclical nature of police brutality uh, from 1960s to the present day. And um, so the analysis, just, just snippets from the analysis, but the analysis will run from four to five pages. Yes, uh, and, and develop like what's going on in their illustration. Okay. We had a couple more examples, like very useful. Okay, so uh, I get two examples from um, a gender, uh, from my gender studies class from the fall of 2018, I believe. And this is Lauren's, uh, she did a ceramic sculpture. And uh, some of the concepts that we cover in class um, are biological determinism, uh, coding of masculine and feminine traits and the process of naturalization. So uh, her piece uh, is, uh, inspired or uh, she thought of Waldorf goddess figurines to represent biology on the external part of the ceramic sculpture, which then opens up okay, to the inside, um, which you can't really tell here, but she intended for the glaze to be blue. Um, didn't quite uh, work out. You could see maybe a little bit at the bottom. Uh, and then there are stars. And uh, so the inside represents um, a world of possibilities. Okay, so not tethered to biology. And then one last example. Uh, this is um, a piece that Lauren, oh, by the way, uh, this Lauren, these are the two Laurens, uh, is an advertising design major. So one of the things about the assignment is, is that I don't necessarily have students stick to whatever, uh, whatever art, or art practice that is tied specifically to their major. So they're free to play, yes, uh, and do things that are outside of their uh, studio major. Okay, so uh, this Lauren uh, was a fashion accessories design major, and she created this performance piece called Backstitch, uh, which is a film in an uncut real-time sequence, and she uses an embroidery hoop to backstitch in one single spot to represent the complacency uh, at work in, anti in Western women's anti-feminist views. Um, and so there are elements uh, that she touches on is uh, the how she chose the dress that she wore, um, the soundtrack okay, that is part of the piece, um, the stage setting, and then most crucially, the, uh, her experience of sitting in one spot and backstitching repetitively until the fabric starts to fray and rupture. Um, so, and then again, there's a four to five page uh, abstract that accompanies this piece. Okay, and then uh, those two, those same two women um, got together with three other women from that class and um, we worked together to develop an exhibition proposal. So it's another uh, further example of transfer. And um, we used one of the course readings um, by Judith Butler to come up with this umbrella concept of um, still less than human, Women 2020, uh, and then to, as a way to contextualize okay, their work together. So what do I want to say about that? Um, oh, this was also, so you can see this was proposed for CCS's U245 gallery, but it was also proposed and accepted for gallery showing at Swords into Plowshares Peace Gallery in Detroit. Um, and unfortunately, that was in the winter of 2020, so that never materialized uh, due to the pandemic. Okay, so to wrap it up, uh, transfer works best when made explicit. 
And I think that's also true for all of our pedagogical moves. If we can um, make those explicit, it helps students tremendously. So um, I think about transfer between one cognitive skill or concept and another, uh, to some degree between liberal arts courses, um, between liberal arts and art and design practice, uh, between education and career or graduate program and education and life. And uh, in terms of the last uh, idea of transfer, I think it's really important to consider, especially uh, in an art and design school where a lot of students use a creative process to think through personal um, or life issues. And all of those student examples um, that I showed have high degrees of self-reflexivity. No. And then finally, uh, I thought this would be a good context okay, to share the call for sessions for uh, FAPE, uh, Foundations in Art Theory and Education. Um, <clears throat> that's, it usually takes place every two years. So it's next year at the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design in Denver. And I just listed here um, the topic areas that relate to liberal arts specifically, but you can access the whole call for sessions, um, which is a more extensive list as well as a description um, of the conference theme series play. So, and I think that's it. Great. Thank you so much, Heidi. That was awesome. Mm -hmm. Our next speaker up is Jen Fitzpatrick. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. One sec. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today, because I deal almost exclusively with freshmen, is designing a course. Um, truthfully, actually, um, I have obviously not updated my biography on the website. Um, I have my BFA from the University of Michigan, my MA from Wayne State University, and I just finished my MFA at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in summer of 2021. Um, a lot of what my practice has looked at and what I bring to uh, the idea of teaching, particularly with freshmen, is understanding the multiple variables that uh, are at play as they begin what is going to be a very uh, a very in-depth, very rich experience of maturation in that very first year of college. Um, so in order to get at this, uh, what I have to do is I have to remember that these students are beginners. And truthfully, we're all beginners. Um, whenever we start something, if we enter it with a beginner's mind, um, we can approach it without uh, sort of prior ideas about what this should look like. And that opens up a different pathway, a pathway for what visual language uh, could look like. So this is a really formative time. Um, I've studied it uh, at SEIC. I studied uh, D.W. Winnicott. I studied um, his texts and wrote a course for myself on Winnicott. Uh, his texts on the development of uh, true identity versus false identity um, through methods of play. And methods of play can cultivate this idea of seeing. Seeing is the defining attribute of the visual artist. Um, so, you know, as I've written here, you know, a student endowed with visual spatial intelligence is going to develop analytical skills knowledge and vision related to a visual spatial language. Um, so if you think of design, and when I say design, I don't mean specifically just uh, tennis shoes or, or uh, graphics, but design is inherent in everything. Uh, design is the ability to make choices and organize visual prompts. And if you think of it sort of 
as uh, analogous to grammar, then you realize the beginner needs to understand the grammar first. Um, they need to uh, speak words, form sentences, and eventually they can get to a complex idea uh, by combining the different elements and principles engaged in visual language. Uh, they also need to acquire a form of disciplined inquiry. How do they get at this problem solving? And of course, uh, they're undertaking all of this while going through um, a time of change. Uh, whether they're leaving home or not leaving home, uh, they're going through this time of uh, identity transformation. And it's always good to remember that. So as instructors, um, what we need to kind of do is prepare, yes, of course, we all prep, but we have to think about how we speak. How do we speak wisely to beginners who are in this uh, position in relation to their world? Uh, we need to have this enthusiasm for our, uh, our topics, our methods, and especially the people that we are engaging because the, we are in the people business. But all of this is to create curiosity. Curiosity is the key driver. That's the carrot. That's the carrot that we want to get them with. And when curiosity begins, dialogue happens because questions can be asked. So if you think of instructing as, um, as sort of helping to uh, puzzle out something, um, if I give them a prompt, it's intended to be a sort of a puzzle. And that puzzle might have many different solutions. Uh, and there may be solutions that fit better and uh, they obviously end up you know, following one or, or more paths in a particular direction. But that first early stages of curiosity, of puzzling, these are the most valuable. This is where many possibilities exist. And if we can get these possibilities, these ideas to originate in the student, um, then they take ownership. So critical evaluation happens throughout the process. Um, it's a form of subtraction. It's a form of editing. And it is the place where the idea is sculpted. And the student, once they take uh, control of the ability to self-correct, to edit, when they become their own best editors, that's where they gain momentum. That's where they begin to feel as though uh, this is coming uh, truthfully as a form of uh, communication created by them with references and resources. I'll address that in a minute. Um, but specifically uh, as a result of their own intellectual uh, pursuits. Um, so realizing that these students are inexperienced, the first thing you see when you teach freshmen is they tend to, they do create, analyze, and critique kind of all at one time. First sketch out of the sketchbook, uh, first three sketches out of the sketchbook are uh, usually these students creating something, already analyzing and declaring it good or bad. This is it. This is the one, this is the greatest idea ever. And that is the first thing we have to sort of retrain. Um, I don't like the word train because that implies that they have to do it the way I do it or they have to do it the way someone else does it. Um, we need to sort of free them from this idea that things must be declared good and bad and look at the valuable aspects of, uh, of that thing um, one at a time. And so we engage each stage of the process, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, attentively um, and mindfully, just as that stage. So process, process is a very important part of, of what I teach, clearly, as a studio artist, uh, teaching other studio-driven skills. And uh, skills and knowledge um, are important, but the students need to see themselves in the process subjectively. Um, they need to be able to map their presence in the process of forming an idea. Uh, then they need to know when to look for criticism and be open and free to say, hey, 
through your lens, what, what is your response? Uh, not just my, from myself, but from their peers, uh, you know, their sort of design team, their, their studio mates. And then eventually, when is, when is the time to now commit this idea to some physical form or digital form even? Um, so this is a very idiosyncratic process, um, but it's very, it's very essential and it's fragile, especially with freshmen. Uh, there's a, a sense of self that we see in May that was built over the course of the first year that began as a hope in September, but becomes an identity by May. Um, so the need for repetition and variation of assignments and participation and critiques, I'll go into that in just a second here. Um, materials for developing a course. So if you, so how do we do this? How do we do this great sort of, you know, uh, philosophically driven, psychologically driven, uh, you know, socially, uh, economically driven thing? How do we get to this in practical terms? So the first thing, of course, is we have program learning outcomes and course learning outcomes, um, and we design project outcomes with any project to use a logic that will um, accumulate in a scope and sequence that lays the platform to build on for the next project. So project briefs are very important to me, and I write project briefs for uh, various different projects I design into a curriculum. And the project brief usually includes how much time this will take and what materials uh, should be used. But it also includes forms of critique and ways of generating questions and finding methods to solve those questions. And it, it insists that the brief insists that this project when finished will have in fact resulted in more questions that the student is now curious about that they want to answer. And one of the ways I approach this so I can show them how they, uh, how they get from beginning to end is by having them write an artist proposal. Um, I'm going to stop share for just a sec here and show you that. And then I'll hop back in this in just a moment. One moment. So at SCIC, I had a, uh, a professor, um, who worked with, uh, who worked alongside Chris Sullivan, um, who's a professor of film, video, and new media at SAIC. And the idea of writing a proposal and starting students writing a proposal at a very early stage of their career allows them to begin to ask those important critical questions, but in the form of a proposal so that they can ask themselves. Uh, they can answer using um, sociology and psychology, um, as well as semiotics. Um, you know, they can answer, they can set a challenge for themselves and answer that challenge within the proposal. So without going through all of this, um, the idea is to, to ask oneself questions. What is the proposed project? What is a sentence that encompasses the main question? Um, what is a narrative or linear description of the work? Um, what are the themes of the work uh, that are addressed outside of the work itself? Material elements, the present state of the work, where are you at on this piece? And what is your thinking? What are the pathways you might follow? What is a general problem that your work is gonna negotiate? Um, and getting very specific about that, moving from generalities to specifics and closing statements. So by having students, um, write a proposal, we um, get to a place where, let me share a screen again. Um, we get to a place where, um, I just realized I didn't even show you that, where the student now has the ability to um, make some very uh, specific choices, i.e. coming up with three or four answers to the question that they have proposed to address. So um, this is the beginning of the process. When they dive into a process, 
we need to have them document this process continually, not just uh, a beautiful photo of the finished piece, but by documenting the process continually, it's gonna allow them to speak to their engagement with the challenge or the question uh, and how they navigated this journey, this very idiosyncratic journey in their own particular way. So I'm going to show you a PowerPoint um, by the student Samaria Kelly. And this was a project to create a wearable. And when I have them uh, deliver this PowerPoint, I have them do it in a style called Pecha Kucha, meaning chit chat. It's, uh, it's sort of the antithesis of an academic style. Um, you can go to pechacucha.com and see you know, lots of Pecha Kuchas on any, any subject in the world practically. But basically they're gonna show five slides and they're gonna talk for you know, 20 to 30 seconds a slide. So they give us a deep dive really fast. And what it does is it creates conversation rather than sage on the stage. Uh, it's a way of talking with their audience. So this is Samara Kelly's wearable. So the first slide that the student always presents his research. Um, if they were given this concept of the wearable, how did they approach uh, using materiality and form and think about what it means to wear? Um, is it part of identity? Is it a way of carrying something? Is it a container for self? Uh, is it protection? Um, whatever it is we wear is a form of communication, always. And so they're asked to address this. So Samaria went into this with the idea that a wearable um, might communicate something very specific that she had no real, real way of, of uh, having a conversation about. So she decided to create a male vest where the male would in fact be worn on the outside of the vest instead of being in uh, you know, the male uh, vehicle or in the male bag, that by wearing a male vest, she could um, write letters to people who she was no longer able to have a relationship with due to family circumstances with. And she would write the letters and wear the letters as a form of um, making herself um, approachable and allowing herself to be open to, to show visibly that she was desiring communication. So this is a sort of a tricky concept. How do you demonstrate that you're desiring communication? Um, so she built herself a male vest and covered it with, uh, with all of these letters she had written for, for the members of her family with whom she could no longer um, have uh, any relationship and was able to wear the thing that she couldn't have say, that she didn't have words for. And that is the strength of um, visual language. That's the strength of what these kids who are creatives bring. They, they can get at something with their visual creative work that sometimes there are no words to express. Um, Val Weiss and I were working on a project I was doing about three years ago and we'll be working on it again soon, which is exactly about uh, that concept, the concept of being able to compose uh, with uh, visual elements composed with imagery to speak to something for which there are no words. So, um, oops, went forward too fast. Um, so teaching um, involves, teaching and, and developing an assignment should involve a, a set of things which are all uh, interrelated that will allow the student to use many, many aspects of their both objective and subjective thinking. So active and participatory visualization, um, where we perceive an object and we investigate many, many forms. Linear thinking, 
executive functioning. And we talk a lot about this, you know, getting students, you know, to uh, follow up and, and hit deadlines and, uh, you know, land that plane with enough runway left to, uh, to make any sort of adaptations needed assessing tools and materials, but this is just one part. And so I, I like this list because linear thinking and executive functioning are one part of what we're designing for when we're designing a course. We're also designing for iterative or cyc uh, cyclical thinking, um, circling back again, resolving again, possibly for a different outcome and being able to get less precious about uh, the work so one can see it objectively where it is situated in sort of you know the landscape that's being questioned modulating attention um, and focused uh, so that you can sort of help them to balance what is uh, important uh, what is less important and maybe even create a hierarchy of what matters the most so they don't stray too far away from from the goal Synthetic thinking, um, and this is what um, we were just talking about with transferring from one area to another. Uh, synthetic thinking, the idea of combining complementary techniques and ideas. Uh, my students will uh, read poetry, they'll watch film, they will uh, interview uh, others, um, as well as uh, practice with materials and drawings. And analytical thinking. Um, which is where they all want to get to. They want to get to a point where they can deconstruct and understand their work um, as well as that of others. And, and that's the trick really. Um, I still, uh, after 40 years of doing this, I'm still uh, remembering to deconstruct my own work, to challenge myself, to ask myself my own questions. Because it's when they can challenge themselves, when they can, can critique themselves often and regularly um, and with uh, curiosity and, uh, and a joy in finding out, uh, you know, something that they didn't previously understand from the work, the very work they created, that's where the carrot is now grabbed and the student can be off and running into their sophomore, junior, senior year and beyond into several more degrees if they want. So um, that's my presentation. And um, I think we're stop sharing. Find my way back here. Perfect. Thank you, Jen. Um, I think I love the idea of curiosity as the carrot. And I think both you and Heidi spoke to this idea of using coursework to develop a sense of intellectual and creative autonomy um, and exploring that as like, it's just the start of the journey, I think is really interesting. Um, so at this point, we are going to move into Q&A. Um, I think we're going to have people just, you know, unmute um, and chime in. Um, if you have questions, you can also feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll be monitoring that um, if you have questions for, for Heidi or Jen. I can um, get us started with a question for the speakers. Thank you both Jen and Heidi for your really um, insightful presentations. The question I have is how do you stay on top of new instruction trends and strategies? Sorry, the phone's ringing. Um, how have these strategies changed in your department over time? So thinking about it for you personally and also what you've seen your colleagues or peers doing as well. Um, I think the instructional strategies question is always interesting because um, when we get to um, the classroom, I think we we need to have sort of uh, we need to have the goals fairly strictly delineated, at least for freshmen. But then we also um, we need, I, my feeling is uh, I need to do as much listening um, as I do asking. Uh, ask, then listen, then ask again, then listen. So I wouldn't say that's necessarily part of any particular trend in education, but I think it's a very important 
um, and unique to teaching skill. Um, that would be my response. Okay, so um, I think uh, the perusal that I uh, shared is like an example. Um, and so I don't know, I just try to stay engaged professionally and, and also the FATE conference, um, I'm on their mailing list and social media. So um, there's one, uh, one primary way that I stay up on what the trends are in pedagogy. And, um, and I've been teaching for quite a few years and uh, my background in rhetoric um, and composition in English departments in general uh, tend to focus more so than many academic disciplines on pedagogy. So it's something that I've been thinking about since uh, I was a graduate student. So I just try to continue as to keep engaged. Thank you. Jen, it might be helpful if, if you're open to sharing your, um, like the proposal that the students write um, to sharing that information, maybe we could put that up as a, as a link for a resource. And same with Heidi, like the perusal and things like that, when we, when we post this, we can post those um, as resources links for people who may wanna use them, that would be great. I had a question of, uh, and for the sake of time, I didn't address, I didn't really go into my last slide, which is about um, work from um, uh, a, a Hungarian psychologist, um, Mihai uh, Csikta Mihai, and he writes about flow, optimal experience, and how that can be created. But I didn't wanna drag on too much further because I know we're short on time here. So. Um, I also have some resources on how that how flow is created from the youth writing proposal, using a proposal as a source of creating optimal experience. So great. There's links all throughout my PowerPoint. So I'll just uh, cut and paste those and um, who do I send them to? Becca? Yeah, you can send them to me. I just put okay. in the chat. So um, when we share out the recording, we can also share out the additional information um, okay. too. Great. Thanks. Rachel, I believe you had a question. Or make sure you yeah. have the floor. Yeah, um, yeah, I I really appreciated, especially the the beginning of uh, the discussion about uh, making readings accessible to students. And I was wondering, um, uh, you know, I just mentioned that you have like the reading guides. Uh, when it comes to like assessing. Um, and then you, you know, you have some students that are, that maybe have like learning disabilities. How, do you assess them differently or do you let them like demonstrate that they understood the content in a different way, um, than other than class discussion or, um, I guess I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure. So, um, I didn't go into all the ways that I developed the reading guides, but, um, they're, one, they're not, um, they're not weighted uh, heavily, but it is a way to get students to engage in the reading. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so uh, I don't grade grammar or mechanics or anything like that in the reading guides. This is a very informal type of as assignment. And so, um, you know, if I ask them to develop open-ended questions um, or sometimes it's useful to have students try to connect concepts from the reading to um, things in their awareness for pop culture, or art and design. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, they're not weighted uh, terribly heavily, but uh, I've never had a student um, complain about the reading guides. Um, so usually uh, they're really um, happy to have them. So, um, and I also use them sort of as the basis for, for class discussion. But, um, and then they have the questions also right in front of them, yes, you know, in class, which is useful. And then a lot of times, you know, students take uh, quite a few notes, you know, they can use the, I usually print those out if I'm in the classroom and students take notes on them. Um, and so, you know, they're getting content, uh, even if they're not um, doing all, all of the readings. So uh, and I should also say that in Prusel, they, um, the AI will evaluate um, student annotations 
and send the instructor report and you can use those or not use those, but you can also sync, um, sync that up to your gradebook in Canvas as well. Okay, I think that um, if there are no other questions, um, we can probably start wrapping up. Um, I uh, will kick it over to Brooke to close us out. Thanks, Amy. So I guess with that, uh, we will close today's session. Thank you so much to Heidi and Jen for your fantastic presentations. Um, and thanks to our audience members for your great questions. We will be resuming our faculty professional development lecture series in the fall um, with information to follow uh, closer to the events via email. And we really hope to see all of you back again for our future sessions. Thank you.